Hello and welcome to the lecture on Darwin and Hardy. In this lecture we're going to be looking at how the writings of Charles Darwin influenced Thomas Hardy's writings. So let's begin with a little bit of background on Charles Darwin. Darwin was a naturalist, a type of scientist that focused more on observation than experimentation. And he conceived of the theory of natural selection, which is what we're going to be looking at for our purposes in talking about literature. This theory um, he came up with in 1838 after a five-year trip on the ship the Beagle, which charted the coastline of South America. So there were a lot of previous discoveries that had happened in the late 18th and early 19th centuries that did impact Darwin's work and also um, kind of all of the literary movements that we're going to be looking at, specifically naturalism. So although Darwin is the most probably famous for shifting the conversation about science in the 19th century, he was really building on a lot of other work that was happening, including work in natural history, astronomy, and geology. So although we're not looking at the broader scientific frame and we're just focusing specifically on Darwin, you should know that he is part of a larger movement that was happening across all of the sciences. So he did compile a lot of his observations and published The Origin of Species in 1859. The main argument that we're focusing on is about the struggle for existence and how the struggle for existence results in natural selection. So essentially what this means is that since more species are born than can survive, those best suited to survive will do so. So that means all of the um, offspring in a particular species are competing for the same resources and those that can get the most resources will be able to survive while the others will not. And these stronger survivors will then mate with other strong survivors which produce an even stronger offspring which has a better chance of survival. So the idea is that natural selection will lead to stronger and stronger offspring and stronger and stronger species. Now, of course, this overview of Darwin is very simplistic, and we're only looking at just a little snapshot of his argument, because we're not talking about it in terms of scientific history. We're talking about it in terms of how this idea of the survival of the fittest impacted the literary movements that were happening in the 19th century. So just to be sure you understand, if you want a deeper understanding of Darwin, you should, of course, look to science classes instead of literature classes. So we're just looking at what um, Darwin did in terms of literary movements. So there's several implications that happen from the scientific conversations that are going on in the 19th century. Um, number one is that the conception of history begins to change. So rather than thinking that history is put in biblical terms, which would position the origins of the um, earth at about 2,000 years prior, instead what their learning is that humans were not necessarily the center of creation and that they therefore were not as important to creation but instead are just another species like any other species and are participating in this natural order rather than a divine order. So with calling into question this divine ordering of the universe, this increases a lot of spiritual doubt for people. So they're having to rethink their faith and you'll see that that issue of rethinking faith um, also coming up in lots of different places in 19th century literature, not just in Thomas Hardy's work like we're going to look at this week, but in people like Tennyson's work, um, just a lot of different areas across um, poetry and fiction and nonfiction in the 19th century. So when you're thinking about changing the conception of time, changing how big the universe is, um, you're also changing this idea of human purpose. So now instead of thinking perhaps that people are divinely ordered or ordained to do certain things on earth, instead you have this unknowingness about what humans are supposed to be doing. So this of course leads to ideas and questions about our um, human actions full of meaning or not? Are they predetermined or not? What's the role of free will and how much real agency do humans have to exert on their environment and on their lives? Another offshoot of 
this particular scientific theory is that it does support or people use it to support um, the expansion of the empire. So there's a lot of talk or discussion outside of literary circles about how if one species is more evolved, quotes around that, right, because this is just um, what people are using in terms of justifying their own colonialism, then they could therefore go and impart um, their own evolved mindsets and uh, ways of education and government onto other countries that they see as less evolved. So it becomes very problematic pretty quickly when people begin to lift these scientific ideas out of their um, their normal parameters of discussion and then use them in different ways in society to exert control, to justify certain behaviors, and um, to really kind of play with this concept of of what it means to be more evolved. So again, that is kind of a different area in terms of history and in terms of um, political science that you see that come up and you have the, the impact on religion and people um, really thinking in terms of religious purpose. But we want to talk about specifically this week what it looks like when these ideas are put into literary theory and into action in a literary text. Let's look at Thomas Hardy and how he incorporated some of um, Darwin's theories into his work. So Hardy lived from 1840 to 1920. So what you'll see by the dates of his life is that he actually is born in mid 19th century and lives well into the 20th century. So he is a transitional figure and we're gonna be looking at him as a way to finish up our conversations about realism versus fantasy and the impact that that discussion had in the 19th century because Hardy's contributing something that makes him pre-modern. So late 19th century into the 20th century and really shows this shift that's happening away from this division between fantasy and realism in the 19th century and into new concerns and new issues that really mark the beginning of modernism and 20th century writing. So by 1872, Hardy has established himself um, as a novelist, and he's also very successful as a poet. The main thing to remember about Hardy is that he's actually credited with the introduction of fatalism to the novel. So this prefigures this move to modernism. And if you're not sure what fatalism is, that basically is the idea that everything is trending towards an end that's beyond your control, that there's really nothing you can do as a protagonist, and that it, it's very basically a depressing or pessimistic worldview. And people were very offended by his novels. And he actually even stopped writing fiction because what happens is people read these fatalistic, pessimistic novels and they didn't want to face this bleak view of the world that Hardy was proposing to them. And he's really kind of known for these novels that do have these bleak outlooks. And they received such bad reviews that he ended up quitting the writing of fiction. Hardy's work is also really well known for its use of naturalism. Now, naturalism is a narrative type like realism, but it is influenced in Hardy's case by Darwin's survival of the fittest perspective. Hardy was very aware of Darwin and had read his work and was interested in this idea of how to compose a novel with a worldview that would mirror or reflect what um, Darwin's theories embraced. So when you see something like naturalism, what you're going to see is a rejection of fantasy of any sort. You're going to see a rejection of romanticism that was earlier in the 19th century and the ideas of imagination and inspiration. And instead, you're going to see um, that harsh realism that is really much more focused on social conditions and on things that are happening in the everyday without any sort of rose colored glasses, so to speak. No imaginative perspectives um, that would make things seem beautiful or um, inspirational. And instead, it's really going to emphasize the kind of harsh social conditions that are happening in the world and the harsh conditions of nature. So what you would see in a naturalist type of novel in Hardy's case is that nature is very random. It's not going to help you or answer you when you're in trouble. Nature is not something like where for Wordsworth or Coleridge, you could look at nature and be inspired and it would provide this sense of the sublime or um, a source of inspiration for poetry writing or for the self to know itself. Instead, nature is something that is actively 
um, almost working against you, right? That you are having to struggle within nature, as Darwin would say, the struggle to survive. And that nature is harsh and bleak and it's out of your control. It's not something that you exert your will over. It's something that is um, a place of combat between you and other species. And it's a place of struggle. So in novels like that, characters can't shape their environments. Individual will or individual inspiration does not matter. So human action then is going to be determined by biology and heredity. Are you a species that is adaptable to survive? Do you have heredity that actually brings you characteristics that are superior to others in your species? And if so, can you exert those characteristics, not necessarily your individual will, that those characteristics on your environment in order to shape circumstances best for your survival. And there's a lot of evidence within naturalist novels that um, the working class is really becoming that sort of evidence of humans' inability to overcome their environment, that there's this misery to human existence that is supposed to speak to the fact that the environment is not your friend. It is not something, nature is not a place of, of love and care. Instead, it's a place where people suffer. And that suffering is evidence of a universe that is not divine and that does not care about individual human agency. So you can see how this would be rather bleak in terms of a novel. So there is a difference between realism, which we looked at before, and naturalism. Realism can often be comic as well. It doesn't have to be. It can be social realism that's looking at um, social problems like factory conditions and still have a happy ending at the end. Um, but even realism in something like Jane Austen is comic realism. The individual is still subsumed by the community through marriage at the end of a Jane Austen novel, but it still has a happily ever after. Naturalism is not going to be that way. It is almost always going to be tragic because the individual being subsumed is where the individual as part of the species cannot escape the bleakness of nature and the harshness of the conditions that they're experiencing. So naturalism in that sense, um, much bleaker version of realism, much harsher version of realism, and distinctly tied to the new scientific theories that were placing the human not as an agent of um, divine intervention in this kind of cosmic play that had been set up, but instead as a part of a species that's struggling to survive. So it's a quite different type of worldview that's being worked out through this type of literary theory. As we look at Hardy's The Sun's Veto, his short story, I'm going to ask you first to look at the realist and eventually modernist qualities that we can see in this story. First of all, you have the emphasis on community perspective that opens the story. And this is evoked by a narrator asking us to look at Sophie in the beginning and to make judgments about her based on the external. So we're given the back of her head and this intricate braiding that has been done in her hair as an example of really the futility of her time and her life. So as we learn later, Sophie is an invalid. She's living alone. She basically has no friends and no social life at all. And she spends all of her time elaborately braiding her own hair. So you have this image at the very beginning of futility and of wasted effort. And this is what we've seen from the back, but it's also positioned as a sort of mystery and a sense of beauty, potentially an aesthetic, beautiful act. But as we realize, it's actually one of emptiness. So the realism um, comes through this, this emphasis on the superficial or on the, um, the descriptions of the external. And the modernist is, is beginning to creep in with that emphasis on um, things being empty of meaning. Right, that there can be this beauty to it, but it doesn't really signify anything in the same way that it would earlier in the 19th century, where um, people would be more inspired um, by things that are beautiful rather than seeing them as empty.
We also have Sophie's life described as a tragic comedy by the narrator. So there's some irony here. Um, increasingly in modernist works, when you have realism, you're going to get pushed more and more into ironic readings. So this irony is being um, really um, emerging through this juxtaposition of her circumstances um, within the literature in the context of reading her story as a type of literature. Again, because she's every day, she's not really significant. So we have this kind of push towards trying to make her significant at the same time that the author is really telling us that she's not very significant. We expect her to be beautiful, but she's not really that beautiful. We expect her to have some sort of triumph over her circumstances, but as we've seen, she doesn't have any triumph. So there's this kind of tragedy to what is supposed to be a comedic meaning um, happily ever after. Uh, it becomes a tragedy for her. She has this happily ever after where she has achieved a marriage above her station. She has a son that's become a gentleman. She's left a fortune where she would be able to live independently, but yet she's incredibly unhappy and dies alone. So there's definitely um, much more irony here than you would see in earlier 19th century realism. You also have some references to the community in scientific terms. It's easy to miss these things that Hardy is placing in there that can be echoes of Darwin's theories, which I'll talk about in just a moment. But you do have in the opening this description of the community and their fixation on this concert that's happening where the community is described in these terms of how there's um, world upon worlds, right? There's all these layers to the people that are supposed to be important and to the concert um, that's going on and that the people in the audience probably knew exactly what was happening. But the narrator's um, push to keep us outside of that also helps us to remain in this observer, almost scientific detachment to what's happening so that it minimizes the importance of what's happening in these people's worlds. It turns it into something that's insignificant and that doesn't have that um, vitality to it because the narrator is pushing back against this idea that we should care um, as much as the people care who are there in the community and instead is distancing us from them. So again, that narrative tone is quite different, where in more high realism, which would have been written in you know, the 1850s, 18, early 1860s, you would have been invited into the community and known all of their cares and everything that happened to them. When you get to the end and you're dealing with something like naturalism, you're a lot more positioned externally to that and you're not invited into the community and the concerns of the community are minimized more so. Along with that, you do see some of the regular qualities of realism that we've talked about before, the deflation of ambition and the compromise of the individual in particular. So Sophie does not get her happy ending. She can't exert her own agency. So we have realism that is harsher here. It is not her compromising her individual self into a marriage that is the happily ever after. That's not where the story ends. Instead, that's the midpoint of the story, and then we see everything that plays out after, and we learn that actually it was really not a happy situation for her, and that she tries to escape the situation by um, telling Sam that she wants to marry him and pleading with her son to be able to marry, but then that doesn't happen for her. She doesn't have enough agency, and so she um, loses this ability and really um, to escape her circumstances. Let's look at some of the connections specifically to Darwin's theory that are underlying this story. Mainly what you're going to want to think about is the struggle that's happening here between Sophie and her son. So the struggle for existence is the thing that we're, we're pulling from Darwin to look at and to think about how that idea of the struggle for existence is manifesting in this text. So there's a couple of different places where we can see that struggle happening. First of all, you should think about social class. Um, Sophie herself is lower class. She is a parlor maid in a minister or a parson's home, and she's doing labor. 
So when she marries him, she is elevated from the lower class to the middle class, really almost upper class, not quite upper class because um, the, the minister or the parson is still having to perform some kind of work in the community. He's still dependent on other landowners or um, aristocrats granting him holdings or a living where he could have a salary. But it would still be a significant um, evolution for Sophie to leave her lower working class life and background and to become part of the gentleman's class. And this is supposed to give her an, a great deal of advantage here. But in fact, what you see is that Sophie herself does not evolve. So even when given these opportunities by her husband for further education, we're told that she still mixes up her verbs. She doesn't pronounce them with the same um, social class expectation type of grammar that would have been seen at that time period. So she's revealing her class through her speech. And she's also physically handicapped, which makes her less fit to survive. So physically, her prospects are diminished. She can no longer do um, the work that she was doing before. Socially, she's elevated through this marriage, but we're also told that her husband is ashamed of this marriage, that he moves them to a different location in London, essentially because, as it says in the text, he's committed social suicide. So for him to marry below his class is actually really bad for him. So he's trying to erase that class distinction for her by educating her, by giving her lots of um, new clothes and a new environment where nobody would know her, and to, to take away any sort of stigma that would have existed for him marrying her. But she doesn't really, um, she's not really capable of evolving in the way that he wants her to. So even though she's moved up financially, she's still not happy. She has more advantages, but she can't really, as this is what Hardy is implying here, she can't really escape her heredity. So you can see how problematic this would become, that someone, um, when, you're, when you're looking at Darwin's um, theories being applied in a literary text, the implication is someone is born into a certain class, they can't ever escape that class. That background and who they are because of that background can't be erased by education, can't be erased by new wealth, um, that it's still clinging to them because it's part of who they are as um, a type of species. So this is a very bleak idea, right, that you can't overcome disadvantages, that once you're born into a certain level, that's it. So what you see play out is that in the end, Sophie does not survive. She doesn't find that happiness because she's not able to adapt and evolve and she can't, she's really constrained by the heredity of her social class and by the eventual physical handicapping, which does come as well through her service and her labor. That she's injured on the job and that this, um, in fact, um, limits her throughout the rest of her life. So you have this struggle that's happening between her and her son because he, even though he's a product of the gentleman um, father and the working class mother, he's born into all the social class advantages of the, the father's class. So he goes to one of the best schools um, that money can buy. He has all the education of an upper class man. He has all the advantages. So he then is positioned to be the dominant survivor rather than Sophie. So the narrator's descriptions tell us these things um, in terms of Randolph's evolution from child to man. That when he was younger, he was more like his mother. He looked on the natural world and he saw the stars and he um, felt connected to the natural world, but he becomes, as the text tells us, less natural the more educated he is. And that means that eventually he's disconnected from the things that would have connected him to Sophie. And I think most um, shockingly in the terms that the narrator tells us, he says that the education Randolph receives had sufficiently ousted his humanity, making him a different type of being, or we could think of species, than his mother, who was more close to nature, more in a natural state, um, 
And then as Randolph becomes more and more educated, he cares less and less about his own mother as a person. He only cares for other people of his same class. He's embarrassed by her. He's um, really just ashamed and he doesn't want to have anything to do with her. And then especially once she announces that she wants to marry someone back in her own class, he forbids it. So that's the veto from the son's, um, the son's veto title. So after making Sophie swear not to marry Sam, what we see is that she continues pleading with him, but he never backs down from it. And that Sophie eventually at the very end, what we see is her funeral procession. That Sam is standing outside the grocers and he's watching as Sophie's funeral procession goes by with the arrogant priest who's her son um, sitting on the, the cart for the procession. So you have the son who never gave in and his dominance is his survival, right? He has ascended where Sophie was not fit to survive. That's really the outcome of the story here is that a naturalist worldview says because Sophie could not adapt and take advantage of the things in her environment that were given to her, she was destined to fail. And Randolph instead is able to take advantage of the class distinctions and to exert his will, even though we're, we're to see him definitely as a villain in this, because it's told from Sophie's point of view, um, he still is the one who survives at the end. He didn't have to compromise. He got what he wanted. His mother never married and never betrayed his class and never embarrassed him. And he has ascended into wealth and privilege and into a certain class that he wants to be part of. So the happily ever after does not happen here. As I mentioned before, the marriage that Sophie had was not really the one that she probably would have been happiest with. And she even thinks that to herself, what would her life have been like if she had just married Sam instead? And this really is never completely answered satisfactorily. Again, some of that modernist and realist ambiguity coming in here is that we have to ask ourselves as readers if Sophie is also implicated in this story. Could she have survived in this world? Um, what if she had just married Sam? They could have had a happier marriage. She wouldn't have been injured because she would have quit her job before the injury. Um, she could have been um, a successful woman working in a greengrocer's um, store aside, beside Sam, beside a happy, loving husband. And who knows what else could have happened? She instead ends up far away from her home, outside of nature, in the city, alone with a son that doesn't love her. So there is an element, a small element of choice here, but you also see some of that choice erased in the proposal when the priest, um, Mr. Twickum, or Twicket, asks for her hand. She sort of accepts because she doesn't really love him, but she also doesn't know how to say no. And there's this sense where maybe things are out of her control, that she doesn't really possess the ability to say no to him, that she's sort of in awe of him and can't really figure out how to say no. So there is, again, this idea that maybe she is just not fit enough to survive, that if she could have said no, if she could have made different choices, then her life would have been different, but she's actually not capable of making those choices. So the individual agency here is definitely erased somewhat, where you see her externally more as someone that's struggling in situations that are beyond her control and her capability, rather than someone that's exerting her own agency and her own will. I wanted to end with this story and with the movement of naturalism because we're having a shift at the end of the 19th century away from a lot of the themes that we've been talking about so far. So Queen Victoria dies in 1907 and by the time of her death, the major movements of the 19th century, including Victorianism, are beginning to wane. 
what you have at the end of the century is much more a feeling of weariness and jadedness, the movements of aestheticism, which are more on art for art's sake, rather than teaching any moral lessons. There's a lot of growing doubt about the, the project of empire building and colonialism. And this really, all of these things lead to a lot more alienation between authors and their readers. So this emphasis on early 19th century romanticism in terms of inspiration and imagination and revolutionary thought, um, and then that Victorian earnestness, sincerity, the sense of duty, and really the whole project and fascination of both realism and fantasy and all its variations begin to be replaced by an inward focus, by this focus on fractured narratives, on psychological realism rather than comic or social realism, and really a lot more emphasis on symbolism, irony, and then particularly themes of despair as you move into um, early 20th century with the um, beginning of World War I. So you're gonna have quite a different feeling in the culture and a lot of different emphases within literature. But you start to see some of the roots of that with Hardy's different type of worldview that he's bringing into his literature. We're really not seeing that same ideals of inspiration and imagination and the joy of nature and the, the interest in what can the supernatural do and how can we entertain people with detective fiction and what, do, what does it look like if we depict um, our social conditions with moral earnestness or try to tell people the truth through our literature. Instead, you have this distancedness happening and you really see that I think in the sun's veto with the narrator pushing us away from Sophie at the beginning telling us that we're really not part of the community um, helping us to I think see her in more objective terms where we would have to perhaps have a judgment on her but then at the same time, not telling us to have a judgment, not trying to teach us anything in the same way that a lot of realist texts would do more um, directly and explicitly to readers. There's no real um, lesson to be learned at the end of the son's veto. We can make a judgment on Sophie or we cannot. We can judge her son or we cannot. But instead, we're just given a story and we have to um, read into it what we will. So there's some distancing there that's happening, which will eventually increase as we go into the 20th century. So as we finish up this semester, I just want us to end with this idea of realism versus fantasy and what these tensions have been doing and how they've played out in the 19th century. So these tensions between realism and fantasy um, really exemplify the idea of how we use the combination of imagination and reason to make meaning. So we've looked at all these different ways that meaning can be made and how pleasure can be created for readers, depending on what the emphasis is within the text. Is it asking us for imaginative participation and the willing suspension of disbelief about the supernatural? Is it asking us to observe and watch characters and to discover truth? How are we really creating a sense of meaning and pleasure in a text? Well, these 19th century texts we've looked at have pulled us back and forth and blended imagination and reason in different ways, asking us to investigate how to do that. And authors have really manipulated these modes to call attention to different things. In some cases, it was social issues. In some cases, it was providing suspense and entertainment and really overall exploring how we use our relationship to reality to generate new knowledge, what we think is real versus what we don't think is real and how those things work within the text to create pleasure and knowledge. When we get to the 20th century, this question of stable meaning becomes suspect. So while both types of literature, realist literature and fantasy literature are still written, that tension between the two is no longer the focus. So what happens then is that we move away from looking at what the real and what the imaginative can do together and in different varieties. And instead, the, the um, focus becomes much more on the interior, on the problems of subjectivity because 
how do we know what's real if we are really just trapped inside our own minds? So psychological realism becomes the place of modernism and this interiority going deeply into the mind is going to become the new way for people to explore how to create meaning or really the big question of the 20th century, if meaning can even be created at all in literature. And you can't really write realist texts if you don't think that words can create meaning. So you have this kind of deconstruction that happens beginning in the 20th century that really is not the same as what was happening in the 19th century at all. So when the modes of realism and fantasy are explored again, it's going to be through magical realism, which is a much more contemporary um, postmodern um, literary movement. So what you'll see then if you get into later British literature is this reemergence of the realism and fantasy trends being combined, being juxtaposed in order to challenge readers expectations about how we understand what is real. But that is going to resurface after uh, modernism and after a lot of other um, explorations by authors about what literature's purpose is. So as you leave the 19th century and as you're thinking back, um, I just want you to take away the ideas of realism and fantasy as underpinning some of the major developments of literature in this time period that we still even see today. Thanks.